Okay, so uh, I would actually first like to thank David for this wonderful microphone. Um, <laughs> yes, we're all using his microphone. I see if he did not give us one. Um, and uh, my voice is uh, a little suboptimal today, so I, I really need it. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to be telling you about uh, this jazz. <laughs> why? Uh, uh, why? <laughs> okay, well, if it works, I won't question it. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be telling you about um, jazz today. This is uh, some work that I've been doing. Um, within the last year, and very quickly, this doubles as both a sound check for me and also a preview of the sort of things that I've been building. Ah, uh, yes, it helps to have the thing plugged in. Yes, this is very good. by giving you a little bit of backstory that is not in the paper. Um, you might have thought that I would be working in jazz because I'm generally working in musical communication. Um, I'm working with music and natural language, and um, there's a jazz side to that research. Uh, no, that's not why I ended up doing this. That's not why any of the material in this talk happened. Um, what actually happened is I was very bored at some point, and I wrote this squiggle art generator. Um, and it's written in processing, it's not functional at all. You click it as many times, and it gives you these noodly things. Uh, so I showed it to someone, and they sort of looked at it. <laughs> and they said, Oh, um, that's interesting. Uh, I guess you made an avant garde jazz cover album cover generator. Uh, so you need the album. I need music now. <laughs> <laughs> I never put an idea like that in my head. It's, it's going to make things happen. And then, oh look, that actually helps with my research. <laughs> but now I had a problem. Uh, for the last decade, my research has been in this space. Um, and I thought this was a very good model of music and how music composition works. Um, I do a lot of work with AI now, so I think of things in terms of agents. So we have two agents here. We have one agent, the composer, who's telling you which notes to play, and another agent who is the performer who decides how to make those notes sound good. Um, all of the rest of my talk is going to be on this side. Um, I'm just assuming that sound somehow happens and it's nice. Um, the uh, everything that I do is going to the MIDI level, so it's just assuming there's a synthesizer there to handle that and make it sound good. I'm also assuming that the instruments aren't agents. That is changing very slowly. We are starting to get uh, essentially smart instruments that make some of their own decisions, um, but I'm not working with those. This is a better way to think of jazz. So, first of all. Um, Improvisation and composition are really, they're related, but they're two very different processes. So a lot of the time, uh, you don't get a, de a very detailed impression of what notes you're supposed to play. So if you are the performer, you have to, in real time, decide which notes to play, how to play them, and where you're going with this. So this abstract score that you're getting, might not even be fully specified. Uh, if it's just one person improvising, they may be constructing that as they go. Uh, this is a problem for uh, all of the models I created for my PhD thesis and everything I worked on thereafter, so something had to change. 
this is what one of those abstract scores might look like. We have a melody, and um, it sounds like this if we just hear what's written. And then there's all this. <laughs> so the, this means do some stuff. Um, in the traditional classical model of things, we can't, we can't do that. Uh, but what we actually want is something like this. It's a bit saturated. I do apologize for the... So, that, that other bit that came in that I forgot was coming in um, <laughs> was this part. Uh, I do apologize for the distortion. I guess we're doing some debugging right now, but it did this for me earlier, but not to the previous people, so... If you want good audio, hopefully it will be there at the uh, performance evening. So I'm going to call these things I've circled here segments. So here we have one segment per measure. Each one is marked with a chord. The chord gives us some information on what the scale is, what are good notes to play, what are some less good notes to play, although in some styles of jazz it's what are good notes to play, what are other good notes to play. <laughs> uh, hopefully you put them in the right order. Um, yeah, so basically all you get is the, the fixed information for the melody in, in the main refrain, and then you're expected to improvise um, around that. And the bass player and whoever's playing chords, they have to make it up as they go while, while adhering to these constraints. So here's some pseudocode for a really simple bossa nova. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, functions, well, no, these are not functions. Let's assume we have a function that gives us um, an infinite random walk within some scale within the high part of the range that we're working with. And then we have um, something for the bossa nova bass, which is in the low part of the range. That's very easy to do deterministically. Bossa nova is one of the easier styles to deal with this. It'll sound a little bit boring, but um, it's surprisingly good for being deterministic. And uh, a deterministic chord pattern. So we have basically one run of the scale in the middle. We know from the chord symbol what pitches to pick, and we just find those within the scale and play them with the expected bossa nova rhythm. Then we have some, this is uh, Euterpia code, as you'll see later on, this is related to Euterpia. Um, we'll make the, the um, melody and marimba and assign some other instruments. The cut function here, of course, our segments aren't infinitely long, so we're taking the segment length of that random walk, we're making sure that we have um, enough bass and enough chords to fill the segment, converting to instruments, and then putting, sticking it together at the same time. Then we have a recursive call, so we have infinite bossa nova. Uh, this is what that sounds like if we have it over a random, essentially a random a series of scales for our segments. Uh, surprisingly good for very little intelligent uh, decision making. <laughs> <involved> in <laughs> but it also does hit uh, sort of a hard ceiling. Um, for goodness. Um, so it's basically going to sound like that. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll have infinitely much like that, and we'll get sick of it. After <laughs> but let's stick with this model for, for one more slide. Um, so what were we really doing there? Well, we, we can simplify that a little bit and also generalize it. If we give the same interface to each one of those generative steps, so let's assume we have a function 
for generating the melody, which needs to know about the segment length and the segment scale, and needs a generator. We have the same thing for the bass and the chords. All of these receive the same information and return the same kinds of information. Now, of course, the two of the parts that we just looked at are deterministic. Um, that doesn't matter, we can still do this interface, but to get anything better, we absolutely need non-determinism, so we will need that, um, that random threading. So, if each musical part is basically a non-deterministic function from a harmonic context, um, namely the, that segment that we talked about, to notes played, can we just do this? I'm going to say yes. Um, if we also do the annoying passing of generators thing, um, yes, we can do this. Although, uh, we do need to be careful about what we call context, and also, we do also need to sort of permit uh, these, these jazz functions, emulating musicians, to emit a form of context as well. So this is the new model that I've been working with. Um, every musician's behavior at a given point in time is modeled by a function. That is where the vast majority of the hard work goes, and it's what I will be showing the least of today <laughs> as a result of that. If you hope to read the paper finding out how to make a really epic soloing algorithm, it's not in there. Um, but if you have such an algorithm, you can plug it into this system and make it interact with an arbitrary algorithm for any other part and basically sort of drop these algorithms into the framework as long as they have the expected interface here and they will all these musicians will just play together it will just work so musicians of course they need to know about um, what lead sheet we're playing um, so we have our lead sheet segments each one knows about what we're playing right now um, we need to know what our sort of internal state is. The, the easiest way to think about that for a musician, a, a real musician, uh, you know, if I'm playing on the piano, my hand is in a certain position at any given point in time. And that's going to be part of my decision making when I transition to the next harmonic context. I'm in a state at the time I need to start playing things for that next segment. So that's the emission of context that I was referring to. It's basically musicians need to be able to emit their own internal state so that they can receive it again at the next function call. The emitted music is observed by everybody. That is also kind of a form of context. And uh, so that's also that we treat that as a history. So my decision making is affected by what my state is at the current time, what I just heard. Um, and what the current lead sheet uh, segment is. And I've implemented this in a very small library called Jazz Call. I'm in the process of kind of putting more things into it. Right now it's fairly bare bones. And this is sort of where it lives. So Jazz Call gives us a bunch of type definitions and, and general algorithms for putting musicians together once we know how they work. How they work is this top box. So if I have an algorithm for a walking bass player, uh, I can construct that, make it make it match the jazz types, and then have it play with um, an arbitrary collection of other um, other musicians that I've defined. It then uses Euterpia for its uh, representations of things like notes, and then we're going out through MIDI. So as I mentioned. We are just assuming that there's an instrument there to handle the start playing a note, stop playing a note <laughs> events and make sound based on that. Uh, my work on Kulita, which is a very grammar based thing, it has chord spaces, there's a lot of code there. Um, I'm not directly using any of that. Um, Kulita is very top down and I have a real problem right now with uh, after what I know of jazz. Um, with those models applied to jazz. So I decided, okay, I basically need to throw out that way of thinking 
and think about how I would do things left to right. So some things are inspiring the models. The chord spaces are kind of coming back in. But in general, I'm actually trying to stay away from importing that and take a fresh, uh, sort of fresh look at music generation. All right, here are some examples. So <clears throat> remember how I mentioned Remember how I mentioned my voice is bad. Um, remember how I mentioned that the lead sheet might not be a static entity. It might be something that's generated on the fly. This first example, the lead sheet is generated on the fly as all of the music is generated. how it works. I have the file. Uh, you, you can actually look at the code for this piece. Uh, it's in the Jasper library under examples. I've loaded it up here and we can play it and it's going to sound a lot worse because like I said it's expecting a synthesizer to just be there. It's not a very good synthesizer that's just there. But you should hear the similarity. So this is generated in this is <coughs> this is generated in real time. Um, and it can go infinitely long. So if you like this, there's a lot more of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just to prove, again, that it is doing this, we can look at value. Here's the music value generated. Wait, you can't see any of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of, of Haskell scrolling on me. <laughs> um, I don't know how to get it. Well, if you don't believe me, I can prove it to you offline. We'll just leave it at that. All right. Um, here's something rather different. This is that lead sheet that we looked at at the beginning. In the improvisational section with the slashes. So I had this and I said, well, I have a bunch of boss and over instruments. I, I wonder what happens if I just drop those in. And then I said, well, I had some old lead sheets from a long time ago. I wonder if the computer does them better than I did. And the answer is <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> interacting with each other, like the hand drums aren't, say, interacting with the bass, so the f there is the capacity for that to happen if you write an algorithm that supports that. 
uh, and it doesn't have to be jazz. So the, the name from this is because I realized this sounds an awful lot like a certain very annoying Donkey Kong level. <laughs> I really hate that sort of fish. Um, so because we have that, then I've often been asked, oh, well, can we just, can we make a chorale? Can we make a symphony? What, what else can we do? Well, no. Um, we can make uh, something that momentarily sounds like any of those. I could directly rip some algorithms out of Kalita, drop them into this framework, and we could have sort of momentary resemblance of, of Bach or whatever other classical musician you want. Um, there will be none of the long-term structure there because the improvisation process is simply different. So this is not intended for modeling things like fugues where we have these very complex long-term dependencies of things. It's not intended for symphonies. It's intended for this very free-form improvisation thing where we have some fixed elements that we return to, but a lot of it is very fluid. Um, here's some jazzy types. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Basically, a segment has some chord context information and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to talk about. A jazz part, uh, which is our function for an, uh, an instrumentalist behavior in a particular style. We know what instrument to give it. We have a function for its behavior. We have a state. Yes, that is a type variable. Uh, a jazz band is just a bunch of those musicians. And the function for each musician, they take a state, what segment we're at currently, where we're headed, what we heard, and our generator threading. And then we give back a new state <coughs> and music. Uh, and then run band, if we drop a bunch of these in, it just turns through it and produces the music. So, why leave the state as a simple type variable? Um, well, the short answer is because we can and polymorphism is good, right? Is everybody happy with that? Yep. <laughs> really? <laughs> Everybody's happy with that? Yes. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, I can't just skip to the next slide, so the dirty truth is about to come out. Um, I don't actually know what needs to go in it. So, I have some ideas. I have ideas of what needs to go there, but it's actually a very empirical process trying to figure out what represents a musician's state. And, it, and, it, and a lot of it is kind of instrument dependent as well. So this is an open question, and uh, basically thank you Haskell polymorphism for not making me answer it right now. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these as I warned you I would. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Python version of this. So, ooh, I know Python. Uh, um, so basically, I wrote all this stuff in Haskell. I happen to be part of a larger project called Musica, which is Python-based, because if you're in AI, you get Python shoved down your throat, whether you want it or not. Um, and we were doing a lot of stuff with Python, and I wanted to make this stuff work with that, so, yeah, Python. Um, there were also, at the time, some issues getting the Haskell to work interactively with something like this. Um, basically, it would drop communication to the controller. I don't know why. Um, still being resolved. Just check. What? Just check. Check. Check what your connection keep. No. Oh. Forget it. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's some, I think it's something in um, actually sitting below port ready. Um, so rather than play this example, I'm going to tell you to come to the, uh, the performances where you can hear this thing live. I'm going to tick along smoothly here so that I can hopefully have time for a quick demonstration of the Python. Uh, basically, I'm working on figuring out what that state needs to be. That's sort of, um, I don't know, maybe I'll have a paper on that next year. Uh, I'm working on implementing more part funds for different styles. That's one of my ways of figuring out what the state needs to be. Um, working on solo trading algorithms, building up Jazzpool to have more utilities, make it easier to write part funds. And also, um, we're now doing a web interface. So one of the ways we're getting around some of the uh, those 
connectivity issues yeah, that I mentioned. We we we're seeing the the web, uh, but yeah, perhaps it's, it's, it's time to. Well, we'll close. We'll close with. Um, it should show the web now. Yeah, it does show the web now. So we do have the ability to generate this in real time on the web. Um, down here, you can see it queuing up new things as it goes. Uh, it's all C major right now because this only just happened, um, but it's going to get better and then hopefully you can use one of these things uh, in your browser later. Stay tuned. Um, so that is it for me. Um, thank you. You can hear all of those pieces on SoundCloud. You can go get the library. Um, that's it. Perhaps for uh, one question, and then perhaps as homework, you can learn to do endings. Mm -hmm. As homework, you can learn to do endings. I, it does. Oh, it does? Oh, okay. They're just not You like them? Yeah. Yes, one uh, uh, guy there. Mm -hmm. Yes, my question is other than the industrial applications, the elevators, <laughs> 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 the real time class, and yeah, the, the causality, and going only forward in time, that what does it buy you? Like, why is that such a fundamental initial assumption? Because it seems to me that if, if you're just generating something, then if, if you can go back in time, then that would probably be too... Uh, so you, you can't go... I don't know what you mean by go back in time. You can't go back in time. Yeah, but that's what I mean. If you're not, yeah, you're not generating an endless... That would be a... Yeah, so an improvisation can, it is finite, but it can be kind of an arbitrary length of time. So the musicians might decide amongst themselves when to end. Um, so is this, is this also accompanying? I'm sorry? This, you can use this as an accompaniment. So yes, to, to come, to the, come to the performance evening. Right. Yeah. You will hear it in exactly that so capacity. So that's, that's why you don't want it to be done offline. It, Yes, because um, because I also want this to be a practice tool. Um, this has made me practice more, which is good. Hopefully it will make other people practice. It's also useful for data collection, for us to learn, you know, what like what should that state be, gather a lot of data from actual musicians using the system. So, uh, so yes, um, it's, uh, the interactivity is very important um, to, to the nature.